morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. Glad that you could join us for our Sunday morning service on January 24th, 2021. Can you believe it's already nearing the end of the first month of the new year? It's hard to believe. For those of you who are part of our regular congregation, it's going to be so nice when we can finally meet back together in person. We're not sure exactly when that's going to happen, but we're really longing for it. And for those of you who are joining us from outside of our regular fellowship, um, we'd just like to welcome you to our broadcast today and we pray that God's blessing would rest upon you. And, and uh, this morning I'm going to be continuing in my sermon series in the book of First Peter. We're nearing the end of the series. I'm going to be starting into uh, chapter 5 of First Peter today. So would you bow with me in prayer before we start? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. This is a day that you have made, O God, and we are glad and we rejoice in it. Father, there is a special, a special word for uh, people today. And God, I, I know that you have a, have a purpose. And I just pray, God, that you would minister to the people that are out there, that they would be encouraged, that they would be taught in accordance with what you would have them to learn today. And Lord, I just thank you for each person that's out there. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to this final chapter of 1 Peter to the churches in Asia Minor back in the first century, the northern part of Turkey and the Roman Empire. That's, that's who Peter was addressing his letter to. But it applies to us today as well. And in this chapter, I'm going to be speaking to you on the topic of spiritual leadership within the church. So specifically, Peter starts his address with... Uh, um, instructions to the elders. Now, me being an elder, a lot of what I have to say applies to myself, but there are other elders out there, and, um, and it's good for the church to understand the role of the elder. As well, um, everybody has a, a response to leadership in the church, and we're going to talk a little bit about that after I speak to you about the role of elder. So, would you please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. Our text this morning is found in verses 1 to 13, and we're going to be starting with the first four verses of the chapter. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So we see at the beginning of this passage, Peter uh, brings a message directly to the elders of the church. And this is one of the overwhelmingly convincing passages of Scripture that speaks of the truth claims of Jesus. Now, we see Peter here, an eyewitness to the suffering of Christ, fully convinced of the resurrection of his Savior. Not only had he witnessed the suffering of the Lord, but he also saw the glory of the Lord as Jesus rose from the grave. He had heard the precious promises of the Lord as one of the twelve original disciples, and he was convinced that Jesus was who he said that he was. So much so that Peter, along with his fellow eyewitnesses, were ready to die for the sake of the message of Christ. The commission that they were sent with was to take the gospel into the, into the ends of the earth. And Peter um, was willing to do anything to accomplish that mission. He assures his readers that he and they that are his companions in the faith will also share in the glory of the future, which will be revealed in the last time. Peter didn't just speak these words. He lived them. Church history tells us that shortly after the books of First and Second Peter were written, Peter was actually put to death for the cause of Christ. And uh, he did so um, with great honor. He laid a foundation for the church to be built on, connected to the chief cornerstone as one of the foundation stones of the original church. 
History tells us that Peter went willingly to his death under the persecutors of Rome, even begging them to crucify him upside down because he didn't believe that he was worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord Jesus Christ. This man was a true example of humility, a true pastor's heart. Peter calls himself a fellow elder along with others who would also bear that title throughout the ages. Now the idea of elder came from the church life in the Jewish culture. Now for example, there were many times where Moses called the elders of the children of Israel together to hear a message from the Lord. The word elder simply speaks of the maturity and wisdom that an older person should have, making them qualified for leadership. In its application here, however, the word elder is more about wisdom and spiritual maturity than it is about age. Translating this practice of the Israelites in the Old Testament era into the New Testament era, according to Acts 14.23, we read, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. The apostles were appointing elders in each of the churches that they had planted. There, were also, uh, there was also the development of the office of um, the pastor who was essentially a teaching and a preaching elder. There are more than just teaching and preaching elders in the church. The pastor is an elder that is committed to teaching and preaching the word of God so that the flock can grow. According to scripture, there were elders who directed the affairs of church and there were elders who did not direct the affairs of the church. In 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor especially those who, whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Further this, to this, Paul instructs Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, saying, And these things you have heard me say in the presence of many witness, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. It is written by Paul to Titus, in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9, the reason I left you in Crete was so that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Peter appeals to all of the elders in the church. His message is both to preaching elders and to all the other elders within the church. He encourages them to be shepherds of the flock of God under their care. A shepherd's job, let's reflect on that for a minute. A shepherd's job is to lead the flock placed under his care to green pastures to graze, to waters to drink, to keep them together for their safety so that they would not wander off alone, and to stand guard over them and protect them from wild beasts that might want to devour them. Elders in the church are to lead people to good spiritual sustenance. Guard the unity of the church under their care. Encourage the people to stick together and guard the people from the doctrine of false teachers who are plentiful, who want to lead the people astray, just like ravenous wolves. The shepherd must be aware that there are also wolves in sheep's clothing who under the influence of the enemy of our souls may try to gain access to the flock. Or they may, be fully, they, they, may be, they may be fully knowledgeable of a treacherous plan that they have in play. Or maybe sometimes these same wolves may be unaware of their negative influence but are being used as pawns by the enemy. 
Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and he longs to render the Church of Christ ineffective in their God-ordained mission. And often he uses people who are out of step with the Holy Spirit to discourage and cause division wherever they go. The shepherd is appointed as a guardian to watch over, to pray over, and step in where necessary to protect or discipline the flock that is entrusted to them. I have said this before, that the church is not a building. We have a really nice building to meet in at Hillside, but our building is not the church. The church is, just, is not an institution either. At Hillside, we're an assembly of believers. The church is people coming together for the purpose of serving God as a family. Now, when some Christians think about what it means to be a shepherd, um, their minds come up with pictures of kind of an effeminate uh, picture of Christ longingly gazing into a sheep's eyes as he strokes its wool. Sometimes that's been painted. And it's true that shepherds do have a compassionate disposition towards their sheep, caring and, and, and bandaging and carrying the, the sheep when they're wounded or needing to be uh, comforted, especially little lambs. For those who do not know any better, in the ancient Near East, however, shepherds were not only carrying compassionate um, stewards of a flock entrusted to them, they were rugged warriors who bore the scars from protecting the sheep. And Jesus, with his nail-scarred hands, exemplifies how a good shepherd willingly takes a hit out of love for his sheep. He does what is best for us. Jesus does what is best for us, fully knowing that he would suffer pain for doing it. Jesus exemplifies the ideal of a, of a good shepherd as the head over the people, the church, the one who directs and disciplines and defends his own. It's important for us to recognize that as elders, we are called to live by example what we say that we believe. Charles Spurgeon once said, A man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. If his life and doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept his practice and reject his preaching. I find this quote to be good and sobering. It's something for me as a pastor to consider very deeply and other elders within the assembly of believers that are teaching and preaching. I, re I pray that as one of them, that I would be found faithful before God, indeed, as well as what I have to say. I know that I'm imperfect, and for that, sometimes I know that I am not the best shepherd. So, in those times where I, where I falter, where I'm not the best shepherd, I, I ask that you would forgive me. I do want to serve the Lord as a shepherd entrusted to Hillside Community Church. I want to see you guys grow. I want, you, I want to see you healthy spiritually, able to grow into maturity. I, I love you guys. And one thing's for sure, is when Peter says the elders are to be shepherds, he meant something significant by using this example. You see, a shepherd, as a shepherd, I'm not like a cattle herder driving livestock in front of me. Shepherds are, to, are called to walk ahead of their flock, leading by example and testing the ground ahead with watchfulness for danger. They also scout the horizon for good pasture for the flock so that the health of the sheep will be preserved. He is to lead them to what they need. There are times where shepherds are called to lead the flock through dangerous ground, through barren places, cold places, scary places, kind of like what we're going through right now. 
And during these times, they go out of their way to use their shepherding tools to steer sheep that are straying into dangerous ground and to rescue sheep that have wandered away. And I want to make this absolutely clear. As an under-shepherd, I am answerable to the chief shepherd. And I pray that the chief shepherd will guide me to make good choices as I shepherd in this church. When wolves come, the shepherd will put his life on the line and sacrifice his own safety to protect the sheep. They will not fight um, just merely for fighting. But when an enemy comes to attack the sheep, the, fight, the, the, the shepherd will fight to defend them. The hireling you see fears the wolves and the bears more than is God. When times are dangerous and wolves growl and show themselves in the flock, the hireling will cut their losses and run away from danger, disregarding the safety of the sheep. And Peter is asking the elders of the church, both pastors and other elders entrusted with leadership by God, to fulfill their duties towards the people they are entrusted to care for by watching over them, not because they feel like they must, but because they are willing. And this is what God desires, a heart of flesh that truly loves the people. God desires that a shepherd, his shepherds, serve out of love for the sheep. The work of an elder is sacrificial. Sometimes watching over the sheep is difficult. It can take you away from other pursuits in life, and uh, it is involving. And it can involve both yourself and your family. It can cramp personal plans. There are times when folks get frustrated with uh, the shepherd, and there's times when the, frust- the, the frustration goes the other way, where the shepherd gets frustrated with the sheep. Do you know what I mean? I, what I mean is that it's not easy to keep watch, and it's not easy to, to trust. Keeping watch is not easy. Trusting is not easy, especially when you've been burned. Now, you can let your mind wander to think of other watches in your flesh that you would like to be on. Um, Maybe our flesh desires to be on beach watch, campfire watch, football watch, fishing watch, hunting watch, easy care watch. Divided interests can certainly lead to a feeling of discontentment and can become a temptation for both shepherd and sheep to abandon the flock. Now, there is a temptation for the elder to abandon their responsibilities when it gets tough. It's as if Peter says to the elders, don't abandon your watch. There's huge consequences for family, church, and society when shepherds are distracted by the things of this world and abandon their watch. Brokenness and various levels of seriousness are a result of this. The Word of God is very clear that there are some elders that do not abandon their watches, but stay, however, with a reluctant attitude. This is wrong. Colossians 3.23 says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. In this world of deception, the enemy tries with all his might to distract us from our true callings. He will do it in many different ways, through temptations, through trials, through exchanging God's best for something that is less than, even if it seems good on the onset. Elders, Peter calls us to remember our mission. Remember our Lord and how he gave up everything for the sake of his sheep so that they could experience abundant living. 
There will be temptation to put the things of this world above the things of God. But God has called us to this duty. Christian elders, the Lord wants us to recognize and reject the deceptions that are out there and to embrace the one true mission of the church. While we draw breath, we are to preach the gospel. We are to live the gospel in front of the flock. Nothing on this globe matters outside of the Lord's mission and His plan. And what is His plan? His plan is to share His message of grace, forgiveness, and redemption to a lost world that has been duped into thinking that life is all about stuff, pleasures, and comfort in the here and now. Elders, our mandate is not only to teach those who are under our charge about God, but to disciple their hearts so that they would come to know the Lord for themselves. Discipling is not an easy path, but it is a rewarding path. It is the highest calling. It's not just telling people what to do and how to do it. It's showing by leading, by example. Taking time to show other people life's important truths does take away from other things. The temptation is very real for pastors to focus in on the here and now, to store up treasures on the earth, for ourselves and for our families. But I can guarantee you this, that there is greater treasure for the pastor and the elder who abandons his own comfort for the sake of the cross in the ever, everlasting life that he's going to receive. There's greater reward there than anything that is sacrificed here. And for that reason, I rejoice because I know that the Bible speaks here in 1 Peter chapter 5 that there will be a crown of glory awaiting those who are faithful in the service of their king, the chief shepherd, our Lord Jesus. But Peter does not speak just to the elder. He goes on to speak with those who are younger in the faith, who are underneath the elder's care. He continues in the first part of 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, saying, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. In the same heart that the elder is supposed to shepherd people under his care, the people under his care are called to submit themselves in respect to the elders. Although the elders at times at times may seem stuffy and old. They have lived and experienced different things that make their advice seriously valuable. Now, I've seen people in their early 20s that have spiritual maturity beyond people that have lived their whole lives as Christians. So it's important that if you're older and a younger elder comes about, that you regard him with the same respect as you do an older person in age. Paul told Timothy not to let anyone look down upon him because he was young, but be an example. So, as people who live our lives, we need to heed the scripture here. The advice and directions of elders will often save a young Christian in the faith from making the same mistakes that have already been made by people before them. Hebrews 13.7 says this, Remember your leaders who spoke the very word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. In addition to this, the Bible is clear that we are to respect the authorities that have been placed over us even when it hurts and we don't necessarily agree with their approach because no authority has been placed over us except by the Lord. Does this mean we just stand silent if an elder um, makes an error in his uh, teaching or in his actions? Absolutely not. But there's prescription for how to address that in the scriptures. 
and we need to be very careful to follow those instructions. Um, within the social order of the church, Peter concludes his message by broadening his delivery to everyone in the second half of 1 Peter 5, 5, saying, All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Clothing is something that we put on, is it not? It's a conscious decision. To the natural man, um, we, in our sin nature, naturally want to clothe ourselves with our pride. The phrase, clothe yourself, translates a rare word that refers to a servant who puts on an apron before serving his master and the guests of his master, even as Jesus did before washing his disciples' feet in John chapter 13, 4. I read something that was quite good on this subject in the Blue Letter Bible Commentary, which I think bears repeating. Some marks of true humility are as follows. The willingness to perform the lowliest and littlest service for Jesus' sake. Consciousness of our own inability to do anything apart from God. The willingness to be ignored by men. And truly being other-centered instead of self-centered. Pride in what one has or does is the natural approach and the default of the sin nature. But the scripture more clearly defines what this humility means as a child of God. When we're born again, it says in, first, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. So Peter backs this saying by Paul in Philippians, imploring the church as a whole to clothe themselves with an attitude of humility, with the same attitude displayed by Christ. He says in verses 6 and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Particularly, one of the greatest strategic moves by the enemy is to get us thinking about ourselves and to fill us with pride instead of God's desire to be humble. C.S. Lewis once said this, According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was though pride it was through pride, rather, that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. When it comes to difficulties in life, the temptation is to get anxious about the things that are beyond control and by a side effect of our anxiety, to be tempted to take up our own case and to try and deal with things with our own strength and solve our problems without consulting God, His Word, or other people who have walked the path ahead of us. You see the root of pride? Peter leaves the church to ponder on this point. We don't have to let anxiety rule us. And we don't have to walk alone. Because God himself cares for us. And he walks with us through all of our life difficulties. Cast all your anxiety upon him, says Peter. Because he cares for you. Therefore, we can rest in the Lord and trust that he will give us everything we need to navigate through this tumultuous world. And my friends, this is very good news. Would you pray with me today in closing? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you. God, I thank you that you call 
us to lives of servanthood, to be like you in our attitude. God, as a as an elder that is a pastor, I pray that you would teach me by your word, that I would listen to you, God, and that I would put into practice all that you have called me to be an example of faith, love, and purity. And God, I pray for all the people out there that you'd give them grace as well. Father, that the other elders that are in our congregation would be strengthened and encouraged and would grab a hold of the responsibility that you've called them to with everything that they are and everything that they have. And Father, that the people in the church, Father, would just, Father, grow in their life in you. And for those that are younger in the faith, God, I pray that you give them the same attitude that you had as well, and that we would grow together as your body into the strong um, community of believers that you desire us to be. Help us not to be filled with pride, but be, to walk humbly with you, O God. Help us to fear you, O Lord, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We revere you, O God, with everything that we are. And we ask that you would have your way in our midst. God, I pray that you would help each person as they go their separate ways today. That you would bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.